Hey there, this is Alex Soth in my studio in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I want to share today something that has just been on my mind lately. I was um, having a conversation with a, a friend who's a curator, and we were talking about um, various influential photo books. And, um, and, and I sort of made the argument that that for the 1970s, um, Dan Arbus's Aperture Monograph was probably the most important uh, book of that decade. Whether or not that's true <laughs> could certainly be argued. But um, and, I, and I was thinking about how The Ballad of Sexual Dependency uh, by Nan Golden would be uh, the most influential photo book in my mind of the 1980s. And then I started thinking later about the 1990s, and I was having a hard time coming upon an answer. I should say that I'm talking about American photo books here, um, uh, because I definitely have a much better knowledge of that subject. And um, and when it comes to that era, it's um, it's particularly interesting to me because it's what I was. Uh, inspired by at the time. And and the 1990s were really like uh, the peak decade for me to be influenced by things. And I had a harder time coming up with an answer as to what that might be. And I did a, a kind of a survey on Instagram to get people's responses. And um, you know, far and away, the most popular response was Pictures from Home by Larry Sultan, um, which is, you know, makes a lot of sense. It was certainly uh, influential on me, perhaps, um, you know, I don't know, top five favorite photo book of all time for me. Um, but I don't remember it being as influential at the time, which is interesting. And and I was reflecting on this, and 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 I was thinking about when I was in college. This was eighty-eight to ninety-two, uh, and particularly in that ninety-two area era, um, how how important immediate family by Sally Mann was, and and actually that in this survey that was the second most popular book. Um, and I was just thinking about that and, and thinking about how um, immediate family is maybe less influential now. Um, certainly it's super well known, um, but the, the kind of prominence of, of Larry Sultan's book um, and, and to what extent that was facilitated by its republication by Mac. You know, so all this stuff was swirling around in my head. Um, but I was also thinking about it in terms of, of gender, um, thinking how such key books for each decade uh, were made by women, and reflecting on all that. And then it suddenly like it hit me. I was thinking about uh, the book Pleasures and Terrors of Domestic Comfort, which is actually a catalog for an exhibition. And, and to my mind, it's... Uh, it's the number one uh, most influential photo book, American photo book of the 1990s, at least in my circle of photography, uh, or at least for me. And I, I, I revisited this book and was thinking about it and thinking about the names that we associate with it. Um, and, and I think, you know, Larry Sultan fits into that and Sally Mann fits into it, this domestic photography that was happening. Um, and I think Philip Lorca de Kosha is often uh, connected to that book because he was on the cover and, and, and was reproduced a number of times within it. Um, and so I just want to revisit that book and and pay attention to some of the photographers that didn't get attention then who are getting attention now, and specifically female photographers. And 
and this phenomenon of um, of you know what's considered influential and why, and certainly how having uh, some a, a photo book in print how meaningful that is. So let's just take a look here. Um, this is the book. And, and again, it's just an exhibition catalog, but um, wow, did I pour over this book when, when it came out. Again, the cover by Philip Lorca de Corsia, and um, Peter Galassi was the, was the curator, uh, has, a, has a, you know, good historical introduction, um, and, and, and made a real connection to uh, short story writers and the importance of the home and domesticity uh, in American fiction at the time. And, and, and seeing these trends in, in painting and filmmaking in America, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, uh, the book starts, and we have Philip Lorca de Corsia and Gregory Crutzen, who was uh, just coming on the scene. And a number of references to Eggleston throughout the book. Um, you know, a, a few, you know, just a handful of this, of this, of the, um, the greats from an earlier era, uh, Carrie Mae Weems, again, uh, Nan Golden, Crudson, um, Phil Blorka de Korsh again. Then there's, then we get to a name who, uh, it, it's sort of bizarre. I mean, so Joanne Verberg uh, is a Minnesota-based photographer, and uh, everyone here knows her work very well. And, and not long ago, she had a retrospective by MoMA, um, hugely important, but way underknown, I would say. Um, and... I remember this picture so well at that MoMA exhibition. I mean, I could not stop looking at it. And, and the photograph is of her husband, Jim Moore. And I'm going to show you the book. So this is, this is the MoMA uh, catalog. And, um, and this work from that era is so striking. I mean, first of all, Look at its uh, visual similarity to Philip Lorca de Corsia here. And which I think is a, a bit atypical of her work. Um, this series of her, of her husband, Jim, is more typical, the, this kind of use of repetition. And then uh, these photographs of of her husband reading and in bed. This is uh, how I most think of Joanne's work, often playing with large format focus. Uh, she uses a five by seven camera. And this work is just stunning. Uh, I, think, I think it's fair to say that for Joanne, um, the priority has always been the print, the photograph on the wall, which uh, you know, which is maybe part of the reason um, there hasn't been uh, a, a sort of authored photo book of hers that's well known, um, or at least that I know of. Um, so I, I turn to this catalog, um, and and that might you know, have, have something to do with uh, the way her work has been seen in the world. I'm not sure. Um, but wow, killer pictures. Uh, this photograph is actually in Pleasures and Terrors, uh, Domestic Comfort. Interesting, just a little Minnesota footnote. The title of this uh, photograph says Hankel's photo. So this is um, a photograph sent to her by uh, the at one time, Minnesota-based photographer Jim Henkel. Just a, just a little inside footnote. Killer pictures. Um, and I love this repetition 
of the reading of the newspaper. Uh, it's kind of a resemblance here to um, Jan Groover's work using still life and that play of focus, but um, the way Joanne works with with the human form is so striking. And just thinking about how, you know, Joanne Verberg uh, could have come out of this show being a household name. I, I think someone like Tina Barney uh, got a lot more attention at that time. And this book of hers, uh, Theater of Manners, had come out. I think in the 80s, and, and is a very important book um, documenting her world of, of the very wealthy on the East Coast. Um, and it's certainly an, uh, an incredibly important uh, book, which I actually think of uh, more connected to the, to the 80s in some ways. It's like the... Um, it's the... It's the other side from Nan Golden's Ballad of Sexual Dependency, wealth-wise. Uh, here you have Nan Golden, and interestingly, in a, in a domestic scene of, of her parents, uh, at which is, is more evocative of uh, Tina Barney's world. So, I mean, one notable thing uh, is the lack of photographers of color. And um, I mean, there's, there's Carrie Mae Weems working in that more staged format form and uh, a photographer named Marilyn Nance, who I uh, confess I'm, I'm not familiar with and um, uh, don't know if there are any photo books, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely notable. Uh, and this is a you know a pretty white book. Um, this this is a photographer who I'm also not familiar with, Mary uh, Barrage, um, but I, I believe she's a white woman as well. Anyway, um, so right here, Mary Fry and Sage Sawyer um, are both. Uh, you know, incredible photographers. Mary Fry, uh, in the essay by Peter Colasi, um, is is highlighted. It's he 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 talks first uh, in in terms of the sort of photographers of this time. He talks about Philip Lorca de Corsia and Mary Fry together, and and Mary Fry's work is just incredible, but. It wasn't published until quite recently. I, I believe this book was published in, in 2017, which is called Reading Raymond Carver, and it shows the black and white work of that era. And, and I think what's, um, what's important about this is that this work was made, well, here she writes, I began this body of work in 1979 when I was at a threshold in my own life. I had just completed a graduate program in photography and immediately assumed a full-time teaching position. I was also pregnant. The burden of all these commitments seemed to manifest itself in my image making. Point being, she was uh, very busy making a living and taking care of children. And all of this, of course, informs the work, but I think it also shaped the trajectory of her career and the fact um, that this work didn't see publication for decades. What an amazing photograph. I mean, um, this book, it, it like, uh, it's so, every picture is so good. It's, hard to look at. Uh, I'm just, I'm filled with envy. Cool. 
And you can see how pictures like these also struggled in the commercial marketplace. This was a time in which um, Cindy Sherman and large photographs were entering the marketplace. And, and someone like Tina Barney uh, could work in that world. But this smaller format black and white work um, was less popular unless it was, you know, one of the classic names like, like Friedlander. Incredible work. Um, Mary Fry also more recently, uh, even more recently, published this book of her color work. And you'll see some of this color work in the Pleasures and Terrors book as well. Uh, and it's called Real Life Dramas. And again, page after page of stunning pictures. And, a, you know, an, an amazing uh, representation of domestic life that a man would not have made. Okay, continuing on. Uh, oh, right, and I mentioned uh, Sage Sawyer. I don't have a, a lot of Sage Sawyer's books. I only have two. Uh, this more recent one by Stanley Barker, uh, entitled uh, Animals, shows her work from that era uh, with animals. And... As with Mary Fry's work, just incredible pictures, just one after another. Absolutely fantastic picture making. Um, and I love it. I, 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 I would like to see more work from this era that isn't just animals, that, that includes uh, more pictures as we see here. Um, and uh, this is the only other book of hers I have, uh, um, which is of somewhat more recent work from the early 2000s. Okay. Continuing on. Okay, so here's that Mary Fry color work. Uh, I've never asked Mary what happened with this text that was included with these images. I, I loved this um, when I... When I saw this catalog, it seems to have been stripped away from the work. I'm not sure. Um, another name from that time, uh, well, not from that time, but uh, who got exposure in that exhibition was Sharon Rupp. And she, too, um, published a book of, of her older work only quite recently. It is called uh, Taken from Memory. And um, and as with Mary Fry and Sage Sawyer, just uh, incredible picture making. Interestingly, a, a short essay by Peter Galassi. Um, and and I would say that um, all three of these photographers have a way of making complex pictures that really. Um, dynamically fill the frame. Uh, look at these, these boys back here uh, playing in this runoff. These, all these young women up here. This makes me think of Sage Sawyer. Um, this uh, a person with animals, but I, I love the fact that it's juxtaposed with this photograph. Every uh, flip of the page is a surprise. Wow, what a picture. Uh, really a, a great, great book. All of this visual density.
Anyway, I highly recommend uh, Taken From Memory by Sharon Rupp. Okay, this is an interesting juxtaposition uh, with Tina Barney and Joanne Walters. So Joanne Walters, yet another photographer who only recently uh, published work from that time period. And it was published this way uh, in these there's two volumes called Wood River Blue Pool. Blue Pool is a, is a book of text. And this, this publication, I, I think, was done in conjunction with the Ithaca Image and Text Program. Uh, the relationship between text and image in this book is really quite complicated, and I'm not going to get into it right now. Um, but the photographs inside are almost all of women, um, and uh, it's, the text makes a point of it being white women as well. Um, another, <laughs> another animal picture. Um, great photograph. And so this... Uh, this book, as I said, is um, almost all women. And interestingly, it's only till you get all the way back here that you see a photograph with a man in it, this kind of grandpa-like figure. And then, um, and then this photograph with uh, presumably the father. Um, which happens to be the one represented here. More Mary Fry. Uh, and then uh, Joan Albert. And guess what? Joan Albert is another photographer whose work was only recently published. This is the most recently published of, of all of them, um, again by Stanley Barker, who's doing a great job bringing all this work to light. Um, the book is divided into two halves, mine and theirs. And so it, it, it shows um, her own family. And there's this kind of repeating characters of a, of a father and uh, maybe a, a son. I'm not sure of the, the whole backstory. This I just got this book and haven't spent a lot of time learning the backstory. Um, another photographer who works with all of this visual complexity. Um, it's kind of interesting, this, these repeating um, characters. And then in the, uh, the back, the second section, uh, so it's divided here, then you have theirs. And then we see other families. Um, Etc. Okay, so continuing on here. Uh, so Doug Dubois is is an interesting case because um, when I saw this Pleasures and Terrors exhibition, for me, this was the number one project. It's the thing that I loved the most. I was like, I can't believe this work. I was just blown away. Um, and it did not see the light of day for many years. Uh, Doug finally uh, published that work, I think, uh, maybe about 10 years ago or so. Um, but but it took a long time, and uh, and I think um, you know similar to to a lot of the female photographers we're talking about, he just became immersed in teaching, and his work wasn't in this mammoth scale that the marketplace was demanding, and um, and so it it uh, became less visible for a period of time. So this is, these are the only two pictures by Sally Mann in this 
in this exhibition and catalog, which I found very strange. Uh, it, they're from the, her At 12 project. And, and it makes, you know, it certainly makes sense and, and fits into the exhibition. But of course, uh, her immediate family work would have made a lot more sense. I don't know the history of this. This was published the same year as Pleasures and Terrors, so maybe Mann didn't want it to be uh, part of that exhibition, but um, we all know this work. It's legendary, uh, but it, it, it surely would have uh, fit in well. And, you know, I think it has, um, you know, maintained... Uh, a certain status, but uh, there's something about Sally Mann's work that's quite romantic, and I think um, that romanticism has been seen as maybe less cool over time. Uh, irregardless, I think it's really important work. It's funny to look at someone like Jock Sturges, who, you know, back back in the '90s, uh, you know, every Barnes and Noble would have uh, copies of his books. And, uh, and he was super well known, which um, was interesting. Uh, Joel Sternfeld, and then uh, an, another photographer, Adrian Salinger. So, so Adrian Salinger's work is probably, um, she's probably best known for this teenager's uh, in my room project. And, you know, this book also by Chronicle has kind of a commercial feeling to it. Um, and so it's, it's image and text from the teenagers um, talking about um, their lives and uh, this graphic design, which, it was you know, maybe not the greatest. Um, so the pictures themselves are a bit more, I guess, um, straightforward, which, which suits this more commercial type book. But Salinger uh, did other work. So this is... Um, People who lived alone. Same kind of concept. The graphic design is fortunately toned down. But it still fits into this uh, form of a book that's more general interest, I guess. A book of Salinger's that has probably less <laughs> commercial appeal is, is this one, Middle-Aged Men. I love this book because it has fewer pictures, and, and I think they're, um, they're just tougher. This kind of looks like a, a almost like a Bruce Gilden picture. Um, You know, not not work that's gonna sell for big dollars on the gallery wall necessarily. Um, but I like this work without the text and this kind of um, this formalism and intensity, and the fact that these photographs are made by a woman. Um, Super great work um, that deserves more exposure. So Judith Black is another photographer I remember well from, from this catalog back in the day. And then I didn't uh, encounter her work for many years. And so it was a thrill when recently Stanley Barker published two different volumes of Black's work, um, first Pleasant Street and then Vacation. Uh, this 
this Pleasant Street book, it, it really hit me um, part because of this opening statement where she talks about uh, moving to Cambridge in 1979 to, get, to go to... Uh, graduate school and she was there with her four children and so you can imagine how um domestic life if you're gonna, if you have four children is probably going to play a big part of your graduate thesis work um and the pictures are um are really striking check out both books um so this catalog, there, there are other photographers, Melissa Ann uh, Pinney. I'm, I'm not as familiar with her work, but I know that she has some books published. And it just goes on and on. Um, so that's all I'm going to share from Pleasures and Terrors of Domestic Comfort. I just wanted to say that I think it's a hugely important book and exhibition. And I think it's also meaningful um, to think about all those photographers whose work was exposed in an exhibition and then kind of buried historically um, for decades and only recently got exposed again. So much great work. And um, I do hope you check it out. And I'm grateful that you watched this video. Thanks so much.